Now, I know our speaker has a lot to cover today, so in, interest, in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sapersky. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Ravi, and welcome, everyone. So, let's talk about how science is changing emotional distrust compensation so that you can better defend your municipalities against plaintiff lawsuits. Now, before I launch into the presentation, I want to share with you that this is based on a pretty thorough article I wrote for Bar Journal. So in order to get that article and other resources, you'll want to make sure to go to the resource website for this presentation. And that's going to be at the, in the PowerPoint slide at the bottom of the screen. So if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event, you will find the information to get the resources. The article on which this is based goes thoroughly into the citations, into the details of everything I will talk about today so that you can actually cite all the case law, all the research, know all the information that you need to know. So again, if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event, it's under, it's at the bottom of the screen on the slide, the very bottom of the slide, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot C-O-M forward slash D-A-E event for the resources. All right, everyone. So hopefully you've gotten that and you've taken the time to go and get the resources. Let's talk about the actual emotional distress compensation and how you can make sure to address that effectively when you are defending cities against lawsuits, which there are plenty. I mean, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and Columbus just yesterday was in the news for settling a $1.6 million lawsuit with an ATF agent who was arrested by the Columbus police while he was in uniform and trying to secure a registered firearm for some, someone. They arrested him, they tased him, and he was badly shaken he complained about emotional distress and he was not able to continue his investigative job and so he was eventually awarded 1.6 million dollars for primarily emotional distress and this was just in the news yesterday in my home city of columbus ohio go bucks we're doing really well in football this year so hopefully we'll beat indiana and we'll hopefully we'll beat michigan but anyway, I digress. But that's an example of the kind of activities that you are doing as municipal lawyers. And that's the kind of thing that Columbus, Ohio, really needs to do more of. In, it should not have settled that lawsuit for, or should not have lost that lawsuit for $1.6 million if it used the strategies that I will talk about in today's presentation. That would not have been the case. So let's talk about what we'll talk about in this presentation, the key topics to be covered. First, we'll talk about understanding mental and emotional distress, mental anguish, and emotional distress, what that is. Then the challenges in subjective evaluation, where some fancy lawyers can create a narrative, like about that ATF officer, that caused the jury to believe some things about the emotional distress that are quite problematic and result in big payouts for cities, which we want to avoid. Introduction to a research-based qualimetric and legal evaluations is the third topic. So quality, quality adjusted life year, quali, is a research-based strategy to evaluate emotional distress effectively. We'll talk about some real world examples of how you can use it. And I'll talk about both how plaintiffs and defendants can use it. Of course, you'll overwhelmingly be defendant as municipal lawyers, but you need to know how plaintiffs are using it, just so that you understand that. Then, five, strategies for presenting quali in court. How do you present it effectively? And finally, the benefits of using quali for you as a municipal lawyer. So part one, let's talk about understanding mental anguish and emotional distress. What's that about? So emotional distress and mental anguish have a number of components. Some are emotional, some are cognitive. Emotional include things like intense feeling of sadness, not just regular sadness, but intense feeling of sadness to the extent that it causes distress. 
deep grief, it can be anger. So emotional distress can involve anger, mental anguish. It can involve severe anxiety and panic attacks. That's the emotional part. Now, cognitively, emotional distress and mental anguish manifest as continuous cycle of negative thoughts, rumination, and difficulty concentrating. Rumination is where your thoughts circle one after another, and you seem to be stuck on the same thoughts. That's rumination. And they don't necessarily have to be negative. But separately, negative thoughts is an aspect of emotional distress and difficulty concentrating is an aspect of emotional and distress and mental anguish. There are some physical components that come with mental anguish and emotional distress. Often people feel headaches in these states. They'll feel muscle tension. So if you think to yourself, when you times you felt emotional distress, it must have happened in your life. Sleep disturbances are pretty common. So when people are really stressed, emotional distress causes sleep disturbances easily fatigued, so low energy, GI issues, so gut issues, cramping, and so on, and hair loss. It can be as severe as hair loss, people losing hair loss as a result of severe emotional distress. The impact on people's lives can be pretty, help, pretty strong. So in personal life, emotional distress and mental anguish can severely strain relationships and even break them. They can lead to social withdrawal, where people don't want to interact with others, which, of course, harms relationships. In professional lives, definitely undermines people's job performance. It causes them to be, in, to be absent more than they would be otherwise. Overall, it reduces quality of life. So reducing pleasure and satisfaction in life, and there's a risk of additional conditions like major depressive disorder or PTSD as a result of emotional distress and mental anguish. That's part one. That's what emotional men distress mental anguish involves. Now let's talk about subjective evaluation, which is a traditional approach that we have to emotional distress. Unfortunately, the traditional approach of subjective evaluation, where there's a narrative story painted about, like that, let's say that ATF agent who talked about being tased and then not being able to work and how he's emotionally distressed, not to make light of it, but I'm just kind of talking about the narrative what was presented in the court case, that is problematic. Why is it problematic? Well, it depends on the effectiveness of the rhetoric of the lawyer, and of course, the defendant, or, and of course, the plaintiff in this case. The effectiveness of the rhetoric of the plaintiff lawyer and the plaintiff himself or herself for describing their emotional distress. There is, it's narrative-based. There's no standardization. There's no scientific basis. It's in, there's inconsistent criteria. We don't have clear, consistent criteria for defining and assessing distress. There are tools and scales that are used are quite variable. Often there are no scales and tools used at all. And when they're used, they're quite, quite diverse. It's dependent on rhetorical skills, as I mentioned, to convince the trier of fact, whether it's a judge or jury. And it demonstrates a real need for more objective and reliable methods which is, of course, what we'll be talking about today. So it's also quite variable in how people experience it. Personally, people have a different reactions to the same thing. So when somebody has a divorce or somebody is, let's say, like that ATF agent who is tased and arrested and then let go pretty quickly after his identification is verified, some people would just shake it off and would not that wouldn't be a problem. They wouldn't launch a lawsuit. For others, it's much more intense. And they have, so their different people have different emotional responses to similar events because of their specific context and because of how they perceive the event. And so there's that influence of that personal history and context dependency. Cultural factors. There are cultural variations in expressing distress. In various cultures, people are going to be more or less impacted by social and emotional distress. For example, in Asian cultures, it's often, there's often a lot more distress associated with losing face and community shaming than there is in American culture, or that's not nearly as much of a problem for people to lose face in a much more individualistic culture. So when you're dealing with someone Asian who is in the United States and who has 
facing the severe emotional distress from losing face, they might genuinely have quite a bit more severe distress than somebody who would be if they were American. And there are different coping mechanisms and support systems. So people can cope with emotional distress in diverse ways. And that's something we really need to realize. And that variability really shows the need for a more scientific standardized approach. Unfortunately, we also have a lot of cognitive biases. These are dangerous judgment errors in how we evaluate people's emotional distress. The confirmation bias is a big one. So cognitive biases are the dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our mind is wired. Confirmation bias is one of these cognitive biases. You might have heard of it. It's when we tend to look for information that confirms our preconceptions and ignore conflicting evidence. So let's say when a juror is convinced that, hey, there's emotional distress there by the initial story, they will tend to look for information that confirms their beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. So the impact is that it really negatively skews initial impressions and reinforms existing beliefs. So for example, for a clinician, if somebody is being, if you are being sued for a medical, for a medical lawsuit, somebody broke their leg in, on city property, the clinician can focus on symptoms that fit a diagnosis and overlook alternative explanations. And so that might be an example where somebody got medically ill on city property, but it might not be the city's fault. However, the clinician might overlook that information. Another issue is the anchoring bias, where we tend to over rely on our initial information. So that's the first impression used as a reference point. So we have a distorted assessment due to the initial data. So thinking about how the initial information is presented to us. If you think of that famous glove that so O.J. Simpson was presented and asked to put on and where he pretended that he couldn't put on the glove, right? That's kind of a pretty strong visual symbol where it's pretty easy for anyone to pretend that they can't put on a glove and that, you know, if the glove don't fit, you can't convict, right? <laughs> so that's a pretty strong visual impression. So that's difficult to adjust away from this information with new information such as like, well, anyone can pretend that they can't put on a glove. It's pretty easy to do, right, physically. But after the jury sees it, it's hard to get people to unsee it. So the initial symptom report, going back to the example of a clinician, initial symptom report can influence people's overall judgment. And so people like clinicians and so on fail to adequately consider subsequent evidence. Another problem is the availability heuristic. So we tend to overestimate the information that's readily available, and we tend to remember memorable events. Let's say if you have something like discrimination lawsuits. If there was a recent discrimination lawsuit, people would use that discrimination lawsuit that happened recently as an anchor. And even though it might not be typical, if it happened recently, that's what people will remember, especially it's in the news for one city, then it will be applied to another. So right now, the ATF agent situation is in the news, it might be applied to other cities, and people would be more likely to have pretty large settlements that they may not fully deserve. So there's a bias toward more dramatic and recent cases. And there's neglect of less obvious, but quite relevant information. So going back to the clinician, clinician might be influenced by recent similar cases and overemphasize on more vivid patient stories. Fundamental attribution error is a fourth cognitive bias you need to be aware of in terms of subjective evaluations of emotional distress. We can tend to misattribute causes of behavior or symptoms to internal factors, how people are, rather than their external situation. So we can incorrectly blame individuals for their distress and overlook situational factors. So for example, we can attribute distress to personal weaknesses and ignore external stressors like discrimination. So that's kind of a systematic error where we assume people are personally responsible for whatever happens. How do we mitigate such cognitive biases? So we need to recognize their presence. They're present and they're powerful. I need to train yourself as a lawyer and communicate this information to the trier 
of the case to identify and counteract these biases. So continuously learning is important for you, like you're doing right now with the CLEs. Stay updated with the research on biases, implement best practices in evaluations. And by the way, if you go to, again, there's going to be a lot more information on cognitive biases. I'll send you an article on emotional distress and another one on cognitive biases in legal settings. It's also published in a bar journal. So again, that's at tinyurl.com forward slash T-A-E event, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com, dot C-O-M forward slash D-A-E, E-V-E-N-T. We need to use also standardized tools, validated objective measures like QALY, which we'll talk about in a bit, to ensure consistency in evaluations, to address cognitive biases. So you need to have a scientific approach, incorporating quantitative, clear quantitative metrics rather than just qualitative storytelling, and ensure reliability across cases. That's what will help ensure that the expert witnesses you use meet the Daubert standard, which will enhance their credibility in court. And that's kind of what I use as an expert witness. I've served as an expert witness a bunch of times, and you always as you need to use a science-based approach to meet the Daubert standard or the Fry standard, if that's a standard in your state, or the large majority of states use the Daubert standard. I do both Daubert standard and Fry standard. So moving on to the quality metric. What's that about? The quality, Q-A-L-Y, stands for quality adjusted life year. It combines quantity and quality of life into a single measure, which includes emotional quality of life and mental quality of life. So one quality is one year of life in perfect health. 0.5 qualities is one year of life at 50% quality or, or half of a year of life at 100% quality. 100% quality means perfect health, emotional and physical. Not far from all of us have perfect health, but it's kind of, you don't have any complaints, you're doing well, that's perfect health. There's, you, you don't need to go to the doctor for any specific reason. That's kind of what quality is about. If you, and we'll talk about what it means to have lower quality. And of course, emotional distress does lower your quality. We'll talk about that. So, the length of life is measured in lives, li years lived, Longevity thus is important in quality calculations, how much life is lost in terms of length and in terms of quality. So quality of life is assessed using health-related quality of life measures like physical, mental, and social well-being. So the formula for quality, Q-A-L-Y, combines both length of life and quality of life. Look, let's look at the historical background. How has this quality originated? So it was developed in the 1960s by health economists, so doctors and economists alike. The initial purpose was to assess how important and valuable were medical interventions. How did they impact quality-adjusted life years? You know, the, how much health did they improve? So that we understand how to compare one intervention to another. Eventually, it was adopted by public health experts, health economists of all sorts. So we're using it for policy making, for resource allocation, for so it's used as a pretty standard even for triage in hospitals. The standard quality value is 125,000 in the US as of current dollars. So current dollars, today's dollars, it's about 125,000, probably a little bit more by now. But the basis for that evaluation is that the typical life is valued at $10 million by a US government. The average US life expectancy is 80 years. So when women combined, calculation is that $10 million divided by 80,000 years is 125,000 per quality. Now this will go up a little bit over inflation. So you should take a look at the latest numbers in your court case, whenever you're going to be arguing about quality to make sure that you're using the latest numbers on whatever the US government uses as the standard value of life. But that is the kind of thing that you want to use. So the US government provides definitely the best benchmark for standard life. 
80 years, this is standard life length for an Americans. And then you can use that to see quality. So divide the amount that the US government values life at by the average life expectancy. So let's talk about the research on how much quality is lost, how it's impacted by emotional distress and mental anguish. So there's going to be a study that I cite that's going to be on the slide. And I will, again, that's going to be in the, cited and linked in the article that's going to be, that you'll get if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. It's a study published in Health Quality Life Outcomes in 2017. So reasonably recent study on incremental decrease, it's called incremental decreases in quality adjusted life years, quality, associated with higher levels of depressive symptoms for US adults age 65 years and older. And it's easiest to study quality, quality in people who are 65 years and older, because of course they die sooner and we also have information from Medicare to study them. So let's talk about this loss. It analyzed data from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, for over 30, 500 adults, 36,080 adults, age 65 and over, from 2005 to 2011. And what it examined is an association between quality, quality of life years, and depression, which is, of course, the synchronon of the emotional distress. People are depressed. Now, the patient depression questionnaire, PHQ-9, is the most widely used metric for depression. So the PHQ-9, very, very common, very quite clear, standardized, definitely passes the Daubert and Fry standard. The depression score severity categories go as follows. So if someone gets none or minimal, that's going to be zero to four. So zero to four, if someone gets that score, someone has none or minimal depression. Mild depression is going to range from five to nine, moderate from 10 to 14, and moderately severe and severe is 15 and up. Let's talk about the results. The quality estimates show that the average quality lived from the start of the study evaluation period for each depression severity category. So if you look at the study period, and if you look at how long the people lived with depression, what we see is that someone with who, again, this is looking at the whole population of adults 65 and over. Some people are going for 65 and over are going to be 85. Some people are going to be 65. Some people are 75. So looking at that whole age with people with depression or with a lack of depression, what we see is that someone with none or minimal depression, so the zero to four, is going to live an average of 14 quality, quality adjusted life years. So that's an equivalent of 14 years in perfect health or 28 years in 50% health. So that's, they're gonna have 14 quality. If someone is mildly depressed, so five to nine, they will have just, they will have almost half of that. They will live quite a bit less in that quality. So they'll have many fewer qualities. They'll have 7.8 qualities left until they die. 7.8 qualities. So they will live 7.8 years in perfect health or 14 years and 15, 14, 15 years, 15.6 years in half, 50% health. Moderate depression will lead to another reduction, 4.7 qualities. And moderate, so that's going to be five to nine. Then moderately severe slash severe, 15 plus, is going to be 3.3 qualities left. So you can see a drastic, drastic change in depression. So if you go from non-minimal to mild, you get almost half fewer qualities. You go from non to minimal to moderate, you get 66% or you get something like two thirds less qualities. You go from non-minimal to moderately severe and severe, you get something like three quarters less qualities remaining. So a major depressive disorder is going to be 8.3 fewer qualities. So that's major depressive disorder, by the way, is qualified as someone who has moderate depression. So if you look at the moderate depression, that's going to be 4.7 qualities. So if you add 4.7 plus three, that's five. 
five plus eight, so you can make up the numbers. And so major, and that, that will include some in the moderately severe. So major depressive disorder is 8.3 fewer qualities, that's 65% qualities lost. If they have a mild depression, they'll have 6.2 fewer qualities, 44% loss. So this is clearly the numbers speak for themselves that they will have a significant amount of quality loss, quality loss. And the patterns are consistent across demographics and comorbidities, meaning if somebody is sick with other illnesses. Now, the implications of study is that 125,000 per quality times 65% of quality lost results in $81,250 lost as a result of severe, as a result of a major depressive episode. So the, some event brings about such disorder, the cost the patient should experience on average is just over 80,000 per year. So other studies show similar assessments of loss of quality for other types of mental distress and physical injuries. Now, other peer-reviewed studies support the impact of depression on quality. So here's another study for a quality-adjusted life years in older adults for depression symptoms in international psychogeriatrics in 2000. It followed older adults for four years. It found that depression is one of the worst medical conditions decreasing quality. It's just below arthritis and heart disease. So arthritis and heart disease were the first two worst things, one and two, then quality in terms of decreasing quality of life years remaining. Now, what about this PHQ? How do we know that it's a good metric of quality? So there's a research on that, fortunately. How can we estimate qualities based on PHQ scores in evidence-based mental health published just three years ago? It obtained randomized control trials that administered depression screening tools and the EQ5G3L tools, which is one of the most very commonly used assessments to evaluate quality. What it found is that depression screening tools like PHQ9 accurately correspond to EQ5G3L. So that really validates the use of PHQ9 in assessing how many qualities are lost due to depression. So peer reviewed research supports quality quality analysis of depression, emotional anguish, mental distress, same thing. What about quality in legal cases? Let's talk about that. So quality in legal cases provides objective evidence for legal compensation, not subjective evidence, not narratives, but objective evidence based on standardized scientific criteria. It demonstrates its clinical importance and statistical significance. So Lawyers can use quality to support claims for appropriate, not excessive, physical injury damages. And what we're focusing on today, so you can use quality for both. You can use it for objective measures of physical injury damages rather than someone asking for a gazillion dollars. Or you can end, or you can use it for objective measures of mental and emotional harm. So you can apply the findings on qualities to enhance case credibility and defensibility. So the an expert witness appearing for municipalities, that's what I often do. I talk about how to use quality to quantify how much somebody should be paid, and it's usually not $1.6 million. So let's talk about the Daubert standard to make sure that this is quality is aligned with the Daubert standard. As you know, it's a legal precedent for expert witness testimony. It's used by judges to assess reliability and relevance of expert witness testimony. So the criteria, there are five criteria. Testability, the test theory can be tested. Peer review, that it's been peer reviewed, which you know, clearly the previous step is applying. Error rates, it has known or potentially known error rates. There are clear standards for the technique and it's generally accepted in the academic or other expert community. Let's talk about how quality meets the, the criteria of the Daubert standard and therefore also the Fry standard. Testability. Quality is a very clearly testable, extensively used metric in health economics. It's extensively used in terms of peer review, second standard. It's extensively reviewed in scientific literature. Error rates that are standard and methods that minimize error rates. The standards that are clear established guidelines, including the test that I mentioned before for quality calculation, and it's broadly accepted in health economics and other areas. So widely accepted. For expert witness testimony, Quali provides quantifiable health outcomes. 
And so it's a clear framework for both emotional distress and I also do physical damage, but we're talking about emotional distress here. So you can use it for emotional distress and physical distress. The standardized approach ensures that it's consistent and that it meets rigorous scientific methods. So it simplifies pretty complex health evaluations that you might need to face when you're defending the city against a lawsuit claiming medical injuries of some sort or physical or emotional distress. Okay, let's talk about how qualities are used by plaintiff's attorneys so that you understand what you're facing. Jane Doe was, it's a case I was involved in, was a victim of medical malpractice. She developed a major depressive disorder as a result, which the last lawsuit dragged down for seven years. And so I, I was brought on as an expert witness to assess the impact of emotional distress. And that's separately from physical damage from malpractice. So we're talking about emotional distress. So what I did was testifying to quality impact of major depressive disorder, which we know from studies are about 65% loss per year. So times seven years, that's 4.55 quality loss. Now, usually once the case is settled and somebody is recovering, it takes about the same time to recover that they're lost, that the original time was lost. So the lawsuit was dragging on for seven years, so it will take another seven years on average. That's the scientific average rule of thumb for recovery. So that's the average. Usually it takes about as much time to recover from depression as it took to develop it. And so she was really unable to recover, of course, as long as the lawsuit is ongoing. So the original cause of the depression with the medical hormone practice was not addressed. So the total quality lost is 9.1. Very clear math, very objective, standardized. So we requested the compensation for emotional distress of 1.1 million. That's a standard value of 125,000 per quality times 9.1. She eventually was awarded, so we requested 1.137 1,137,500, she was eventually awarded 1.1 million. And that's just for the emotional distress on top of damages awarded for physical damage. That's an example of a comprehensive use of quality to quantify emotional distress. And it enhances its credibility use in legal cases. It provides standardized objective metric and strengthens the case for compensation when compensation is appropriate and due. So it provides clear and defensible evidence in court and demonstrates how effective scientific methodologies can be in legal evaluations. What about defense attorneys? So let's talk about an example I worked on as an expert witness in a police department. So a municipal case where Jane Doe, John Doe, so was an African-American employee in a police department sued the city for discrimination over a two year period. So claiming racial harassment and unfair treatment led to a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder, which was medical records, he had that documented, and there's a similar set of cases seen by that in recent years. Now, this was a pretty steep request for 8 million compensation, but there are previous case payouts ranging from one to 5 million. So pretty steep case. Now, what I testified was that the city, of course, wanted a different outcome this time, so it brought me in as an expert witness to quantify the impact using quality. So what I testified to is pretty similar. I'm gonna go on a parallel. But the major depressive disorder results in 65% quality loss. Over two years, the maximum loss is plus 1.3 qualities, 0.65 per year. So depression often takes time to manifest, suggesting lower actual loss, and the recovery time likely equal to or less than the time to develop the disorder. So even being liberal, we could say the most maximum possible quality loss, including recovery, is 2.6 quality. That's total of 125, 325,000. That's again, 125,000 times 2.6 is 325,000. So the city ended up paying 250,000, which this was successful of convincing the jury of a reduced quality impact compared to 8 million and was significantly less than the previous one to five million payouts that the city paid. So this was a definite win for the city. And that's the kind of things that you should be pursuing. You should be evaluating, if you use the quality standard, can you reduce the payout for the city? This was definitely, definitely worth it for the city. The case outcome showed that this is an objective analysis for lower compensation. 
it's a scientifically validated, again, quantifiable measure of distress. We emphasize the precise and clear impact of discrimination on emotions, the person's emotions. It shows the power of quality in legal evaluations. It sets a precedent for precise and objective, not excessive assessments, and highlights the effectiveness of scientific methodologies in court 